Good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome, welcome back to Crash Course Economics, or welcome if you're there for the first time. Uh, in any case, it's lovely uh, to see you here. Uh, this is the last Crash Course of this year. Uh, so uh, a very warm welcome to everyone. Uh, you can introduce yourself in the chat, maybe uh, say your name, who you are, and where you're based. Uh, my name is Sarah. I am the coordinator of the Alternative Trade Coalition at the Transnational Institute in Amsterdam. And my co-host is Rodrigo Fernandez, who is a researcher at SOMO. Behind the scenes, we have Jeremy Krollsmith, who is a web developer and uh, just uh, became a dad. Uh, Kees Hudig, globalinfo.nl, and Jenny Pannebecker, also working at SOMO as a communications officer. And they are working very hard to make this webinar a success today. So let me tell you a little bit about Crash Course. What is Crash Course? So uh, we are a collective of engaged activists and experts from a number of organizations. And uh, at the start of the Corona crisis, we united in order to try to understand what's going on and also to reflect on uh, ideas and solutions to move out of the crisis. So Crash Course is a platform. Uh, it's designed to open up the debate on how we can move out of the crisis and also make the necessary steps towards achieving social, economic and ecological justice. And we're inviting global experts from all around the world to break down complex issues and make them accessible uh, to everyone so that we can shape our economic system uh, together in a just and democratic way. So our goal is to democratize knowledge and give you all the necessary tools you need to change the world. So this will be uh, this year's last webinar. Um, in 2021, uh, we will probably also continue, but it's still a question mark in which direction exactly. So uh, at the end, I'll show you our website and you can sign up for our newsletters so you won't miss anything in the next year. Um, and also important to know is that uh, there will be a recording, a podcast and a transcript of this webinar in case you wanna check it out again or share it with friends. Um, so, oh. Rodrigo, up to you. Yes, well, yeah, very briefly. Um, so, this is the, the last episode of the, of the second series this year. Uh, the first series was on uh, the new role that central banks assumed uh, since March 2020, when the pandemic hit and uh, the financial markets crashed. Um, the second series... Uh, has been all about uh, the structural features of uh, contemporary capitalism uh, and how it affects developing countries, the global south. Um, and in this episode, we will focus on uh, yeah, the role of the IMF, the World Bank in particular, uh, how they're dealing with the current situation, um, and also the more political aspect to this. Um, and lastly, we would also like to know what the NGOs are doing and how other people, interested individuals, activists, uh, academics, uh, how they can be part of thinking about these solutions. Um, so that's that's it for today and how it fits in the broader uh, episodes. Thank you, Rodrigo. Um, so uh, because this is the last episode, it's going to be uh, very special. It's slightly different because uh, we will have actually two speakers. Uh, will be shortly introduced by Rodrigo and they will present their views uh, for about half an hour uh, maximum and thereafter Rodrigo and I will interview them for another 15 minutes and finally we'll have a round of questions uh, from your side um, and those questions will be read out loud by uh, me and Rodrigo. Um, it's going to take about one hour and 15 minutes all in total and in important for you to know is that if you have a question, you can pose it under the special Q&A tab you will find at the bottom of your screen. And we'll make a selection of those questions um, based on the ones that are most favored. So if you like a question, you can upvote it by putting the thumbs up, just endorse it. And then uh, naturally, uh, the most interesting questions uh, will pop up uh, at the top of our screen, hopefully. Up to you, Rodrigo. Yes. Well. Um... We are very happy uh, to end uh, this series uh, with two uh, excellent uh, researchers um, from uh, Eurodot. Eurodot has been um, an organization that has been well, very much at the center of much of the activities of engaged uh, researchers uh, and NGOs in trying to well, understand and politicize uh, the way in which the World Bank and the IMF uh, and the G20 uh, have been 
dealing with the current situation. And if I'm not mistaken, um, Adam Toos, uh, for instance, on Twitter uh, uh, remarked about uh, all of the reports from Eurodot that, that, that has been coming out this year as Eurodot doing God's work. Uh, so, well, I, I, I very much uh, favor that. Um, so about the two speakers today, uh, first is uh, Daniel Munevar. Um, he is a senior policy and advocacy officer at Eurodat. Um, previously, he worked at UNCTAD. Uh, he's also been advising the ministries of finance of Colombia and Greece on debt-related issues. Uh, and the second speaker is uh, Maria Jose uh, Romero. Uh, she is an advocacy manager for Eurodat's work on publicly uh, backed private finance and development finance institutions. Uh, and she is previously worked at Latindat, the Latin American organization of Eurodat uh, or network related to Eurodat. And she's currently also doing um, a PhD research at SOAS. So uh, without later ado, uh, I would like to ask Daniel to, well, start his camera and give his presentation. Hi, good afternoon, good morning to everyone. Um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Crash Course, the collective, for the invitation to participate in uh, this webinar series. And with that being said, just give me a second, I'll share my, my screen for the presentation. So I have 50 minutes, so and a lot of ground to cover. So the presentation today is about the Arrested Development Report that we prepared for the annual meetings of the IMF and the World Bank back in October. What we did with this report, we basically went over more than 95 program documents for 81 countries, where we look at what the IMF was doing in terms of policy recommendations to these countries. And we find a lot of interesting, a lot, a lot of interesting uh, findings. So the order of the presentation is first, I'm going to use the first five minutes to have a discussion of uh, explaining what this crisis is about, number one. And then number two, the last 10 minutes, I'm going to use them to explain what has been the role of the IMF in the crisis and explain a little bit about their policy responses. So the first part, understanding the dynamics of the, of the debt crisis. I think that there are two very graphic ways of understanding what this crisis is about. The first one refers to something called net transfers on external public debt. In simple terms, this means how much a country is paying to its creditors, which are the red bars in through interest and amortization of capital, and how much that country or developing countries are receiving in the form of disbursements, which are shown in the blue bars. You say that you have a net positive transfers of resources when a country receives more through disbursements than it pays through that service, or the other way around. You say that you have a net negative transfer when you're paying more to your creditors than you receive in disbursements. And what I'm showing you in this graphic is the evolution of the net transfers on external public debt for 118 developing countries, excluding China, since 2010, and a projection that goes into 2022 based on World Bank projections in millions of dollars. And the first way to look at the crisis is what is happening to this gray uh, line here, which shows the net transfer of resources. So throughout most of the decade, the disbursements towards developing countries have been increasing, reaching a maximum of $400 billion in 2017. But in the context of the crisis, disbursements collapse. And at the same time that there was, the, at the same time that there was this, this, this collapse of disbursements, basically payments to creditors remain broadly stable. And this is what the crisis is about. If you have a situation in which countries have to systematically pay their creditors more, then eventually they're not going to be able to, to do so and the system is going to collapse. So you have two ways of looking at this problem. You either say, well, in order to fix this, you solve 
the problem of the red bar, meaning you suspend, you cancel payments, which is what you're that advocates for, or you try to solve the blue bar problem, meaning you lend these countries more so they can pay back. But that clearly it's a problematic solution because it's just creating a bigger problem down the road. And this is what is shown here. On the graphic on the left, I'm showing the evolution of public debt of these same developing countries throughout the same period of time. And what you can see is that precisely because of this dynamic of increasing disbursement, the public debt of developing countries have been steadily increasing just because of the result of the, from around 40% of GDP to around 60% of GDP as a result of the crisis. Uh, the evolution of external public debt uh, explains around a third of this evolution. And at the same time, or as a result, that public debt has been increasing, the amount of resources that developing countries have to use, that the public sector in developing countries has to use, to pay the creditors has increased at the same time. So what we see is that whereas in 2010, countries devoted around 6.5% of their government revenues to pay external creditors, as a result of the crisis, this showed up to 17.6% of GDP on average, which is a really large number. How large? This is the second element that, it's, that shows clearly what this crisis is about. Currently, as a result of the crisis, countries, developing countries are devoting around 3.6% of their gross domestic product to pay their external creditors. And in the middle of a pandemic, they are spending around 2.5% of GDP for healthcare services, for public healthcare services. So this is clearly problematic because it means that countries, as a result of the crisis, are having to choose between keeping the lights open in hospitals, paying doctors or nurses, or pay their external creditors. And this is clearly wrong. Now, the issue is that when you look at it from the perspective of the G20, of the creditors, where they basically perceive that the solution to a crisis is just to lend countries more, this is where the IMF enters into the picture, which is how do you pump more loans, more debt into developing countries so they can keep paying back. And let's see how the IMF has done in this context. The first way to assess the response of the IMF is just simply in, term of, in terms of sheer volumes. So in this graphic, what I'm showing is the amount of loans that the IMF has provided to developing countries, to 78 countries in the context of the crisis. Since March, the IMF has lent around $42 billion in emergency programs for 78 countries. Now, a useful way to think of this, of how much money it's actually this, is first to look, for example, what they did with Argentina. In 2018, they approved a program to Argentina for $56 billion. So basically they lent more money to a single country than they have lent to 78 countries in the context of a global crisis. And if you look at the amount of resources that the public sectors of developing countries are bleeding as a result of the crisis, this number is around $341 billion. So it's clearly not enough to staunch the hemorrhage of resources that public sectors across developing countries are facing in the context of the crisis. Now, who gets to really benefit from these loans? Because the problem is, is that because the amount of resources that is leaving developing countries is so large, you have a problem. And the problem is, is that countries have not, developing countries have not had enough resources to actually spend to protect the rights of its population and in, as simple as the lives of their population. So as part of our research, we looked at what was the response of developing countries to COVID. And we found that countries that receive IMF loans uh, were able to spend around 2.2% of GDP in emergency programs, not only on healthcare, but also in social safety nets to respond to the crisis. 
This goes down to 2% in the case of ESSI countries and around 2.6% in the case of high and middle countries that have received annual help. But the problem is that because they are so severely constrained, fiscally, fiscally constrained, they have had to actually cut expenditures in other areas in order to finance the response. So what we found is that from these 81 countries that receive IMF support, 40 had to cut other areas of their budgets in order to finance their COVID response. And how significant is that? We found that on average, these 40 countries had to cut other areas of public expenditure by around 2.3% of GDP. In other words, there was no net increase in expenditure, which means that the money that they received from the IMF probably was simply used to pay foreign creditors during the same period of time. In other words, who is actually getting the money from the IMF, it's other creditors, it's not the people of these countries. And why this is problematic? Because when we look at the disaggregation of the fiscal policy response of countries that receive resources from the IMF and that are eligible for the G20 debt service suspension initiative, the IMF found that these countries had to cut overall expenditures by around 1.5% of GDP. At the same time, they boosted expenditures related to COVID to around 2.1% of GDP, around 0.6% went to health, 0.4% went to social protection. And at the same time, precisely because they had to cut back expenditure in other areas, they had to cut expenditure on education by around 0.1% of GDP and on development related expenditures by 1.6%. Of GDP. In other words, we're seeing the implementation of austerity not one or two years under the earth. We're actually seeing austerity right now in the middle of the crisis. But the problem gets worse once we start looking what's going to happen going forward. For the IMF to lend money to a country, it needs to assess that its fiscal policy is sustainable in the long run. That means that Fiscal policy needs to ensure that that at least remains stable. And what is the what is the condition for that to remain stable in the in the in the long run? Well, basically, that expenditures have to go down. If you look at the projections of of public expenditure made by the IMF, they found that in 2020 there was an increase in expenditures as a result of the of the response to COVID. But they expect a steady reduction of expenditures over the medium term, to the point that by 2023, uh, expenditures are going to be below pre-crisis levels. In other words, they are going to shift the cost of the crisis to those most vulnerable that basically literally could not afford any other mechanism to respond to the crisis. And I can tell you, well, I mean, it's 3% of GDP, and you will say, well, I have no idea how much that actually is. A way to look how brutal the expenditure cuts that the IMF is requesting countries that are receiving financial support are, is this, is basically assess the amount of expenditure cuts based on the current levels of healthcare expenditure. And what we found is that for 50 countries, the cuts are at least equal to their current expenditure on public healthcare. For countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, this figure increases to around two, uh, two times their public health ex expenditure. And this is quite concerning because it's not as if once the pandemic ends because of the vaccination, things are just going to be fine because the problem is that healthcare systems across developing countries and advanced economies as well has been under brutal strain, which means that a lot of procedures and a lot of uh, uh, personal turnover that took place as a result of the crisis, it's going to have to be fixed. So there is not going to be an easy way to reduce expenditures as the IMF is requesting. And the problem is that precisely because healthcare was one of the areas where those expenditures increased, then it's likely one of the first areas where there are going to be requests 
for cutbacks. And from a broader perspective, the most concerning aspect of the evolution of, of expenditures is that countries are going to be left without resources to tackle the challenges in the context of the 2030 Agenda, the Paris Climate Agreement, and the Beijing Declaration. So my time is over, but basically, Euro that in response to, to, to the findings of this report and the policy actions of the IMF, what we're requesting is that the IMF needs to reassess its policy approach to the response to the crisis. This plan austerity cuts need to stop, and we need to prioritize the allocation of resources for COVID-19 response and recovery efforts. We can discuss that in the round of, of discussion. It's extremely important that we need to develop a comprehensive post-COVID-19 debt relief and sustainability initiative that takes into account the financing of key development programs tied to the 2030 Agenda, the Paris Climate Agreement, and the Beijing Declaration. And last but not least, we need a fundamental systemic reform uh, of the international sovereign debt architecture through the establishment of a multilateral debt workout mechanism that allows for a uh, fast, transparent, and equitable solution to a uh, debt crisis. Mm, I'll share the presentation with, uh, with the organizers so you can, you can share it to anybody that is interested. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Thank you very much to Rodrigo and Sara for the invitation uh, and to the whole team for the invitation to participate in this in this uh, session. Um, I would like to um, share the findings of the work that Eurodad has been doing. Um, let me... Let me share my screen with you. Um, just a minute, I will do it again. Um, and I will, I will um, share the findings of your dad's work on the World Bank response to the COVID-19 crisis. Um, and that's why Daniel's presentation with a focus on the IMF and my own presentation with, with a focus on the World Bank um, will be quite complementary to understand um, what the Bretton Woods institutions has been doing uh, in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I will first um, situate the World Bank uh, response uh, within the broader um, context of um, the World Bank's approach to development finance, uh, which um, since um, 2017 has been the maximizing finance for development approach. Um, I will then share, as I said, the key findings of um, the report that we released in, in October before the, the annual meetings, together with colleagues from the economics department of uh, SOAS, the University of, of London. And I will conclude with some um, um, main um, messages and poli policy recommendations. So first, um, as I said, um, uh, it's very important to situate the COVID-19 response um, of, the, of the World Bank Group uh, in the context of what has been the World Bank's group approach to development finance since um, 2015 first, and, and the paper that the World Bank and other institutions put together called uh, From Billions to Trillions, and uh, in, in, in the Maximizing Finance for Development approach that was released in 2017. This um, um, approach, um, called by its acronym MFD, um, builds on previous uh, World Bank Group strategies and is part of its broader um, agenda and trend 
um, with a concrete attempt to elevate the role of the private sector at the heart of development strategies, uh, including in public service uh, provision, like health, education, but, uh, but also uh, physical infrastructure. And, and this broader agenda reveals um, um, a series of systematic positionings coming from the bank, but also promoted by major um, donor, donor governments, um, also gathering at the at the C20. First, um, the, the the lack uh, or the unwillingness of the donor community to scale up international public finance. Second, uh, the inability to agree on a multilateral um, resolution to unsustainable sovereign debt, um, something that um, um, Daniel uh, talked about. Um, third, the lack uh, of resolve to create a global body to deal with max ta tax evasion and avoidance. This was a request from developing countries in the um, third uh, United Nations Conference on Financing for Development in 2015. Uh, fourth, the failure to deal with growing criticism and, and negative evidence of this particular way of um, um, deal with uh, development finance or promoting development finance. And, and, and finally, um, uh, it also reflects a fundamental underlying prejudice against the public sector, which has been fueled by austerity policies that have undermined the ability of the public sector to, to deliver. So with these uh, points, what I am trying to say is that uh, this way of seeing development finance, of approaching development finance with the private sector at its core, it's a uh, it's a it's a choice, right? It's it's not a given. It's it's, it's a choice, and it's a choice that match the uh, the resources that the institutional investors have at their disposal that are eager to find a bankable projects with profit um, uh, and stable profit um, at, at 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 their core. Um, and this is the graphic representation of the World Bank um, MFD, MFD approach, right? Which, the, which indicates that um, the public finance, uh, the, the public and concessional finance are seen as the last resort, resort to um, uh, serve uh, the development goals. Um, in, the, in this context is that the, the pandemic um, hit um, the, the the world, right? And what was the the, the World Bank response? So it was quite um, a, a quick response. So in in March, in early March, the the World Bank committed uh, to deliver 14 billion in a fast track COVID-19 facility. Um, and right after the World Bank said, okay, the the crisis is going to be like a big crisis. So as an institution, we will deliver 160 uh, billion um, from now um, until um, June 2021. And then they also said, okay, from, from March um, uh, 2020 to June 2023, we will disperse uh, or we will commit, better said, uh, three, between 330 and 350 billion US, US dollars. And, and this is um, the graphic representation that, that, that you can see. Um, what is important to see is and to analyze is what these um, 14 billion in the fast track rapid um, fast track COVID-19 facility actually mean for developing countries. And was was the distribution, internal distribution uh, of in, in the World Bank of these of these resources. And here um, we go with the first finding of our research, um, which is that private clients were prioritized over the public sector. So um, if we analyze the allocations across the public and private arms of the World Bank Group, um, almost 60% of the emergency COVID-19 resources were allocated to the IFC, which is the um, um, private sector lending arm of the, of the bank. Um, and 
And in our view, this does not respond to multiple calls across the policy spectrum for stronger public systems. Um, the IFC also expanded its uh, work uh, upstream, which means uh, policy work to enable the business environment to attract private finance, um, also accelerated the disbursement of blended finance, which is the use of ODA, Official Development Assistant, to subsidize um, uh, private investments. So in a way, um, the, the allocation of the 14 billion um, in, in itself indicates how the World Bank see its intervention in this context of crisis. Um, our second finding refers to who benefits from the 8 billion that were allocated to the IFC in its um, response uh, to, to the crisis. And the first point is that um, there was a, again, there was a prioritization of the financial sector um, in, in the IFC um, COVID-19 uh, response, because um, uh, four different facilities were set up, each facility inside the IFC with two billions each, and three of them were dedicated to support the financial sector. The third one was to support um, um, other sectors in the real economy. The second um, point uh, here when it comes to who benefits is that financial institutions um, got quite a lot of um, attention in the first four months of the COVID-19 uh, uh, response, uh, right? 68% um, of the fast track, of the IFC fast track COVID-19 uh, project um, by, by sector in value term were allocated to the fi financial institutions. And when we see um, the rest, um, it was it, it was um, allocated to real sector companies, including private healthcare um, um, companies. And the and the third point is that in relation to the type of companies that benefited from IFC um, um, support, we see that um, they were large companies, um, um, half of of this uh, support were to um, companies that were majority owned by multinational companies or were um, international conglomerates themselves. And the rest, the other 50%, were mostly locally owned, but usually large companies. So here, again, the, the, the point is that uh, when it comes to um, who actually benefited from IFC um, COVID-19 uh, response the first four months, because it was the information available to us, we see that um, it was um, large, uh, they, they, they were large companies and the financial institution. So um, um, even though there was quite um, 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 important rhetoric coming from the institution in relation to um, um, supporting the countries and the, um, the groups and also the companies most in need, the, an actual um, analysis of the information available raised quite a lot of questions in relation to the ability of the bank to actually do that. When it comes to how these, inf these, these resources were um, um, dispersed or implemented, um, there was a lack of transparency. There has been a lack of transparency and accountabil uh, accountability and local participation. Uh, when it comes to the IFC, because of the focus on financial institutions, but also when it comes to the activity of the World Bank, um, um, with their support to the public sector, um, because um, the push to to get money out of the door quite quickly uh, imply quite um, um, uh, limited uh, stakeholder engagement um, and also uh, lack um, of uh, information publicly available to engage uh, communities at the national level. And the fourth point that is important to emphasize, also in line with what um, um, Daniel said, is that the World Bank Group's response to the pandemic include a strong component of structural reforms to promote market creation. Um, the World Bank remains committed to an agenda of structural reforms, 
in support of liberalization, deregulation, and a reduced role of the state. And we have seen that in specific cases like uh, Ethiopia, um, Kenya, Indonesia, Ecuador, etc. And um, we um, are also aware that these policies um, um, resembling uh, a structural adjustment policies resulted in adverse developmental and health outcomes with negative impacts on, on gender equality. And finally, the last point uh, with regards to the findings is that when it comes to the World Bank Group's approach to the building back um, a better agenda, um, um, and the centrality of, 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 the, of the private sector there, what we can see is that the World Bank is set to accelerate and scale up the World Bank Group's um, approach to, the private sector, to private sector solutions, including through its advisory role, policy guidance role, and finance for uh, specific PPP um, uh, projects um, across the development world. Um, the, the World Bank is set to um, uh, exert its influence at the national level to change the conditions there to uh, make sectors and countries more attractive to uh, the intervention of, of the private sector. And this is despite um, evidence regarding the multiple risks and implications of public-private partnerships and in general of the promotion of private finance. Uh, including um, their high cost, their fiscal risk, and the questionable um, effectiveness of this strategy and equity implications. And the quote that I included in the slide comes from the interim uh, head of, of the IFC, where she mentioned in, in, in October that the World Bank is set to do this more um, in the future. So the main message of our, of our research is that Despite the rapid response, the World Bank Group risk deepening previous problematic trends in development finance and public systems. The crisis is being used by the institution and major donor governments to further advance an agenda that risk creating um, debt vulnerabilities, additional debt vulnerabilities, and undermining access to universal and high quality uh, services. And on that basis is that we put together um, um, a specific short-term policy recommendations, um, the, the, the main of them being that the World Bank Group as an institution needs to restore the balance between the public and uh, private sector in its um, response to, to the crisis, including in its modalities, instruments, etc. We also um, call on the institution to stop its support for commercial private health facilities that undermine public health systems and that um, might have um, implications for uh, negative implications for women and lower income or, or vulnerable populations. And in the long term, what we are saying is that the World Bank should use this um, 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 uh, opportunity um, and seriously reevaluate its approach to development finance, its MFD approach, um, uh, because building back better requires a human rights based approach uh, that builds resilience and strengthens public systems uh, for, for all. And, and with that, I, I will close um, again trying to make the connection between what Daniel said in relation to the role of the IMF and how we might be in front of a new uh, wave or a current wave of, of austerity and how the World Bank with its role um, and its response to the crisis instead of um, supporting countries to strengthen their public systems, um, it's um, actually contributing to increase their vulnerabilities. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Um, Daniel, could you also put on your camera, please? Ah. Well, thank you both for uh, very interesting presentations. Um, it, it, it sounds a little bit like Groundhog Day. There are debt problems mounting 
uh, across developing countries uh, and the World Bank and the IMF have uh, again uh, a lot of non-solutions that uh, aggravate uh, the, the, the problem at best. Um, but of course, the situation is, is, is different from the 1980s and 1990s. Um, but before we get into the questions, I, I would like to ask Daniel uh, some um, yeah, very brief clarifying questions. Um, first, it's, it's about the, the, the data that you compiled. Um, is it somewhere available on a, on a database uh, that is uh, publicly available for, for, for everyone to see? Uh, is it part of the fiscal monitor uh, database or is it something that you compiled yourself? Um, and secondly, what would happen if we include debt from uh, non-financial corporations that uh, in particular in, uh, in the last 10 years uh, in, in Latin America increased a lot uh, alongside public debt. Um, so before we get into the more interesting questions, perhaps these two more clarifying questions to Danielle. On the database, the database on the IMF work and the impact of IMF policies that is available alongside with the report. I'll put a link in the chat for those interested. There is data on a country by country basis on fiscal pol uh, policy responses, uh, debt, etc. It's a number of indicators. It's a pretty big database, but we hope it's it's quite useful for people that want to dig and understand better what's happening with their countries. And the data for the first set of slides that looks at net debt transfers and evolution and debt, this is compiled from mainly from the World Bank International Debt Statistics. And we're going to, we're doing some work on it and we hope that we'll be able to publish it alongside a small report in early January. So I'll, I'll share that uh, in due time. And on the question on the public debt, yes, the issue is, is that it, it depends on what you're looking at, but indeed, if you're, for example, looking mainly at low-income countries in sub-Saharan Africa, most of the debt is still issued by the public by the public sector. So there is a pretty good overlap there. But it is also the case that when you start looking at middle-income countries, there has been a significant increase in a non-financial uh, corporate uh, debt, and that is one of the areas of of concern because those uh, companies issued significant volumes of external debt in the run-up to the, to the crisis. And now they are, a, a substantial number of them are facing liquidity pressures. And because of the size of these companies, if they go bust, it's usually the country governments that have to bail them out. So this is one of the areas where I think it's important we need to keep uh, an eye on. Thank you. Sarah, would you like to continue? Yes, I'd love to. Um, so thanks to both of you for your great presentations. So much uh, information to process and so many interesting questions to ask. I'd like to start with you, Danielle, on the IMF. Uh, I've also looked at your uh, paper on arrested development and we'll put it online for all attendees and those who couldn't follow it uh, Today and there in this paper, um, you conclude that the IMF uh, barely takes into account uh, things like climate change and the energy transition in its policy framework and its methodology. Uh, so, for example, um, it doesn't pay attention to the fiscal implications of uh, measures related to international climate commitments. And according to your analysis, um, the failure to account for uh, development financing requirements is not a, just a bug, but it's a feature, you call it, a feature of the IMF's outdated debt sustainability assessment. So that's really um, yeah, endemic, I would say. Um, why hasn't uh, the debt sustainability assessment and other tools uh, and mechanisms that the IMF uh, uses have not been adjusted yet to climate change and other things that are happening in the world. And I, we all know, I think, that institutions tend to be slow. Institutional change takes a lot of time, but climate change has been on the agenda for a while and it is pretty urgent, I would say. So can you say something about what's taking the IMF so long? Well, the first part, so in my report, I, I, when I went through the documents, it was, it was quite crazy, literally the word, because out of, it's basically around 
4,000 pages of documentation, if, if not more, climate change was only discussed in around 20 of the, of the documents. It was mentioned 80 times. So just, just so you know that the, the scale of attention that climate change receives in actually program design in the IMF. And when you look at actual program design, climate change considerations regarding of the impact of climate change was only considered included in one country, Samoa. So that is quite interesting in, 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 in what way? That when you push the IMF on this issue, you hear them talking all the time about the green recovery, blah, blah, blah. But when you look at the documents, it's, it's nowhere to be seen. And when you have discussions with the policy offers of the IMF, they say, well, it's difficult because we need quantitative targets and, and, and it's a very complex process. But the fact that they can do it for one country is an indication that they already have the tools to roll it and include it in all of their countries that they are providing financing. So it's actually quite an active choice that they are making not to include this. And the reason is has to do with the DSA methodology. I don't have much time, much time to go into this, but basically the basic story is that the model to assess that sustainability that the IMF has was developed in the 1950s. And it has not changed that much since the, 19, since the 1950s. It has had methodological refinements, what you call bells and whistles, but the logic of the model remains the same, which is to assess how much you need to compress domestic income to free up resources to meet creditor claims. And as long as you can compress domestic income enough without creating economic and political disturbances, the IMF considers that that is sustainable. So that is why none of the considerations of the SDGs or climate are included, because from the perspective of the IMF, that's not the point of a, of a, of a DSA. So we're literally dealing with 21st century problems with a model that was created 70 years ago, which it's a big failure of adaptation to the realities of the world. So as long as there's no like revolution or great public uh, uprisings, that is sustainable according to the IMF. Uh, yes, so it's quite funny because everybody looks at the IMF and well, you know, it's the, the biggest technocratic institution of the world. But when you actually look again and behind the curtains, like the, the wizard of us, what you really find is that the technical definition of that sustainability is, is what I just told you, which is the amount of adjustment that is required to uh, stabilize that levels without creating economic uh, or political, political disturbances. And that is quite problematic because basically it leaves a lot of leeway for the IMF to consider what is politically and economically uh, feasible. Uh, and that means that there is a lot of actually that when it comes down to the negotiations at the executive board, the decisions of when a debt is sustainable, they're not based on, on economic criteria. They are actually based on political criteria, as was shown in the cases of Ecuador and Argentina, where pressure of the U.S. led to grant loans to these countries that are clearly not sustainable and that place an unduly burden in adjustment to meet the uh, uh, the program goals. So maybe if I can uh, continue on that note uh, to, to Daniel on this particular issue uh, on this methodology methodology. Um, so where where is where is the problem? Uh, where in the decision making should we look? Is it something that is uh, political? Um, is it something to do with certain departments, uh, yeah, simply being uh, uh, shielded from from reality? Uh, how can outside NGOs or political parties uh, you know, infiltrate this this problem? But this is a fundamental political problem because the IMF was created as a, as, a, as a creator institution, which is represented by the share of votes where advanced economies share uh, the brunt of the, of the voting power in the, in the IMF. And to this day, still the U.S. holds a bit of power in the decisions of the, uh, of the organization. 
And if you look at the crisis, I can go further back in the past, but if you just look at the crisis of 2008 and the current crisis, again, you can clearly see how the decisions are based not on economics, but on, on politics and in the interests of creditors. The case of the 2008 crisis, when the IMF, when Greece had to go to the IMF to ask for, for, for resources, it was the combined pressure of European countries at the executive board that led to approve a loan to Greece that was not sustainable and that eventually caused a lost decade in Greece. And the fear is we're going right now in the same in the same direction. Yes, yeah, but uh, after this whole debacle, uh, there was a, an investigation and an, an internal uh, evaluation of the IMF policy by uh, this independent uh, IMF department, and then there was this mea culpa that uh, well actually. Uh, the, the policies that it had implemented with the Troika uh, regarding Greece had been wrong. So has nothing been learned from this? No, because and I'm going to give you a, a funny a funny story. Well, it's sad, actually. The whole reform that took place after the, the crisis in 2010 was to create a mechanism where the IMF could only lend resources after assessing that the death of a country was sustainable. What happened in 2018, when Argentina had to go to the IMF to ask for a loan, was that the assessment that the IMF staff conducted at the time showed that debt was clearly unsustainable and that it needed not even a reprofiling, but actually a restructuring, that means imposing losses on private creditors to restore the sustainability of the country. But because of the close links of the Macri administration with the US government, the U.S. government put pressure on the executive court to forego this, uh, this, this protection and provide loans to Argentina that weren't sustainable, to the point that uh, in recent, a couple of weeks ago, a group of, of senators from members of the parliament in Argentina sent a public letter, and a member, staff member of the IMF recognized this, that indeed the program of 2018 shouldn't have happened without a debt restructuring. So the IMF keeps making these mistakes, but they are not mistakes. They are just a reflection of the correlation of power in a multilateral institution where the creditors hold most, most of this power. Right, thank you, Daniel. So before we perhaps jump to uh, solutions, which I hope uh, maybe you can uh, provide, uh, we'll go to uh, Maria Jose now. Um, also about another uh, failing institution, I would say the World Bank. Uh, so you've discussed uh, the the obsession, sort of, uh, of public of a private uh, finance of the World Bank, which I think you see um, on a lot of levels uh, in the world. Uh, but let's stick to the World Bank. Um, so in your research, you refer to the the risks of private finance and also of uh, public private partnerships that are tremendously popular uh, also uh, within the World Bank. And uh, even in the COVID crisis, uh, your research shows, uh, which actually quite evidently demonstrates uh, the need for strong states and public investments, the World Bank has actually allocated more money uh, through its private sector arm than through its public sector arm, which is quite puzzling, I think. Uh, so a bit of the same question to you, uh, how do you explain these uh, political choices? So uh, why is, is uh, the World Bank still preferring private sector uh, finance and spending above uh, the public sector arm. Thank you, Sarah, for, for the question. Um, I think that um, it's important to, to emphasize that um, in the World Bank's view um, of development finance, um, um, the World Bank um, as a public institution and also official development assistance as um, aid, aid resources um, have a major role to, to play, which is to leverage and subsidize private finance. Um, and this is um, for the very, the, the very basic reason that the, the World Bank um, and, and many others um, believe that um, private private finance and the, and the private sector is more efficient in delivering um, um, services and in running 
things than the public than the public sector. Then the, the, the public sector has has a role to play and its role is to enable the activity of, of the private sector. One of the very interesting responses that we have got from um, uh, members of the world, of the, of the World Bank Group, is that we don't live, according to them, in an, in an area of um, state-led development. Um, and we live in an era in which the private sector is the engine of growth. And the role of the bank and of aid money is to um, uh, incentivize um, that, that role of the private sector. So if we are thinking about the very basis of, of, of this um, um, model, we are in front of quite a lot of um, ideology uh, in, in, in this model, because from what we have seen um, uh, throughout the years, um, these models have shown that is quite uh, problematic and it's not a model that um, will actually deliver in the public interest, um, quite the contrary. Um, so um, that's, that's at the core of the World Bank strategy. And that's why it's very important to uh, think and analyze um, the World Bank response to this specific uh, crisis in this broader context. Um, there is no reason to think that um, it, even in, in the context of being in a massive crisis with a very, very um, um, devastating impact, um, all over the world. It's quite unfortunate to think that um, even in this situation, the World Bank doesn't uh, think about uh, reasons, uh, enough reasons to change uh, its, its model. Uh, and as I said, quite the contrary, it's emphasizing uh, its um, um, uh, principles and it's going deeper into its, its uh, strategy. Thank you. Um... Before I ask another question, uh, I would like to ask uh, participants to um, yeah, share any question they have in the in a particular Q&A part um, and not in the chat uh, part. Um, yeah, I, I have a question about this um, program or this, which to me seems more like a slogan from, from, billion, from billions to trillions um, and whether it is not merely um, a fantasy that was never, never supposed to to come true. Uh, if, if you look at the the ideas, the mechanism, it is essentially to transform development projects, mostly infrastructural projects, into tradable financial assets, and to um, all the future income streams that these projects would or could generate. To, to well. To give to give them to financial intermediaries, uh, and uh, in in many ways sidestepping local uh, locally democratic uh, controlled uh, cities or etc. A lot of problems of legitimacy there. But the question is, uh, was it um, realistic from the first place, or before the pandemic, that there would actually be a transformation from billions to trillions? Was it ever to be expected? That there were, was ever going to be an appetite from financial from investors to um, invest these amounts of money in emerging economies, and secondly, now that we are seeing that well, the COVID nineteen crisis has hit big problems with uh, debt sustainability. How will this impact this already unrealistic fantasy? that there would be a transformation from billions to trillions. Will this ever materialize, this World Bank program? Uh, and if it is not to materialize because it's simply unsustainable, then what do we make of it? Thank you, um, uh, Rodrigo, for, for the question. Um, well, in, indeed, you, you are right that that's at the core of, of the from billions to trillions um, agenda, right? It's about transforming um, development um, as, as a whole into something that can be um, uh, attractive for, for private investors. Uh, before the crisis, is, it was clear that um, billions were not to be transformed into trillions. The evidence was, was clear, the money was not flowing. 
and was not flowing to developing countries in the way in which the World Bank and others was, um, were, were promoting, but was even less flowing to um, low-income countries. Um, they are the amount of um, um, private um, finance was really, really um, a small um, amount of private finance. Um, and as, as a result of that, the OECD and others um, before the, the pandemic in, in January this year started to talk about shifting the billions. Instead of going from billions to trillions, it was about shifting the billions because it was clear that the trillions were not to uh, flow uh, where, where, where they were expecting to. Um, but um, with that in mind, um, it's even more important to consider what was the response to that reality. Um, because it was clear um, that they, that they, the World Bank, World Bank staff, uh, main uh, shareholders of the institution, they were aware of that reality that was not new for them. Um, the, the problem is that on the basis of the ideology that I mentioned before, and of course of quite a lot of interest for, um, for, for this specific model to be promoted, the World Bank um, um, and, and others um, 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 continue to uh, emphasize the relevance of their of, of this agenda, of their agenda, and uh, put quite a lot of emphasis and focus to go deeper using more ODA money to subsidize private finance. Um, and also, um, they had been all uh, they, they had been emphasizing also the, the the importance of changing the regulatory framework at the national level which in fact has even more um, longer term implications than the actual projects being approved, right? Because you are changing your environmental laws, you are changing your labor laws, your tax laws at, your national, at, at the national level. You are also changing how um, um, the private sector uh, companies um, relate to other um, um, stakeholders in the economy. You are changing uh, um, um, regulations of sectors, the water sector, the uh, health sector, etc. And and that's why um, these um, um, so-called uh, Wall Street consensus, in the words of um, our colleague Daniela Gabor, has, as I said, even more um, longer-term implications than the actual money being dispersed. This is a very problematic agenda for, from this uh, um, specific point of view. And as I said, because money was not, was not flowing to low-income countries, uh, for instance, in Africa, they were emphasizing this, this model even further. And, and this is, in a way, very problematic in the context of, of, a, of a crisis that we are living in, um, in which um, local people um, um, run the risk of having um, even less access to um, social services than they had before. Right. Thank you, Maria Jose. Before we go uh, to the questions uh, from the audience, so please, everyone who still has a question, Put it in the q a tab i have one more question for you uh which is about public finance there's a lot of talk uh, about public finance these days right in the context of green new deals but also uh, build back better um we've discussed it also in the context of uh the role of uh, monetary policy uh, and what do you think uh, are the prospects for uh, more emphasis on and means for public finance at the level of international institutions such as the World Bank? Do you see any shift coming at some point? Um, because, well, I think the critique is really adamant at the moment. Maria Jose, are you there? Yes, I, I am. I am here. Uh, can you repeat the question? Please? Yeah. So, uh, do you do you think there will be a shift at the World Bank at some point uh, regarding uh, the need uh, for public finance? Because, well, at at the current, we're seeing uh, that the private sector arm uh, is being used uh, still uh, intensely uh, and much more. But uh, when it comes to, for example, financing uh, things like a, a global Green New Deal, 
uh, everyone, or at least a lot of uh, academics, but also at, at international uh, level, people are saying, well, we need more public finance. And um, we've seen, we've discussed in the previous uh, crash course session that uh, the role for, for monetary uh, institutions is there, of course, when it comes to public finance, but this is the same, of course, I would say, for an institution such as the World Bank. Do you, do you expect any change there sometime soon? Well, thank you very much. I'm sorry for my technical problem. Um, well, um, it's very difficult to say that I expect a change in, in the near future, um, um, exactly for the same reasons that my colleague Daniel has um, highlighted for the case of the, of the IMF. There are quite a lot of interest um, um, on the table uh, to push for a model like, like this. And a change can only come if there is a pressure uh, from different sides, including from um, developing countries. Um, and even in that case of having developing countries requesting more concessional resources and also more um, resources free of policy conditions. Um, the, the model um, that has prevailed in, in, in the World Bank, um, it's not likely to allow for, for something like this. And in some cases, they are even thinking about including what some people at the bank call positive conditionality. And in your dad's point of view, this is a very problematic um, uh, way of, of seeing the role of the of the bank, um, because it's true that countries have to um, um, uh, deliver on their commitments on the Paris Agreement, uh, on the Beijing Declaration, on the Agenda 2030, etc. But it should be um, the role of national government to set their their priorities, and not so much the role of the World Bank which is an institution um, um, that uh, it's uh, governed um, for the most part uh, by um, um, Western countries, Northern countries, um, to, to set the priorities and the policy um, choices for developing countries. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I would like to continue with uh, questions from the participants. Uh, and I see that uh, Daniel, uh has already answered two in the chat it's amazing uh, we have never had a guest that is multitasking uh, at this speed so uh, thank you daniel but still there's a question left to you uh the question is by dan uh, i hope i pronounced the name right hello thanks for the presentations uh could you explain what has been the role of private creditors in creating a, a, and continuation of debt crisis in development countries Yes, thanks. Uh, just I wanted to take advantage and then uh, show you briefly what I was mentioning before on um, the definition that the IMF uses for debt sustainability. And I'll connect this to the question both on China, that I know has been partially answered, and on private creditors. But as you can see here, the official document of the IMF and then sustainability defines that public debt can be regarded as sustainable when the public primary balance, that is the fiscal position of the government needed to stabilize that is economically and politically feasible. Uh, and I like to emphasize this because uh, what we need to think in terms of, of, of the challenges posed by COVID-19 and by climate change, what can be more political than defending the human rights of population across the global south and literally protecting their lives? So there is a scope to challenge the technical assessments that the IMF makes, because again, uh, the, behind the veneer of technical definitions and economic analysis, at the end of the day, what we're deciding is how we're going to allocate the resources that we have available to us as a planet to protect ourselves from our destruction 50 years down the, down the road. So, Again, it's fundamentally a political question. And connecting to that on the political aspect of this, uh, what, we're, what we're seeing is basically a very difficult process of triangulation between, advanced, between the Europe, the US, advanced economies, 
China, on the other hand, and private creditors, on the other hand, to address that, the debt burdens that developing country has. And basically, the emphasis that the, um, the World Bank and the IMF has been on China. But it's very important to remember that when you look at the debt of low, especially of low income countries, what you see is that whereas China holds around 30% of the public debt of these countries, private creditors, mainly bondholders and banks from EU countries and the US hold around 30% of the debt. So if we are going to find a solution to the challenges, to the debt challenges of these countries, that means that you are going to have to get on the table both private creditors and China. And what is problematic is that historically creditors have always resisted the imposition of haircuts to resolve a debt crisis until it is too late, until so much, so much time has passed by that most of the costs of the crisis have been transferred onto debt to our countries. And the IMF has been an instrumental part of this by using optimistic adjustment projections that force countries to try to repay debts that are fundamentally unsustainable. So what we need to do is to move forward to a multilateral framework at the UN level that sits all of the creditors and debtors at the table to try to find a solution that distributes the cost of a crisis in an equitable way. Check. Great. This is, uh, I think, a great recommendation. I hope uh, IMF and World Bank and uh, creditors are watching too. Uh, in any case, next question is for uh, Maria Jose. It's by uh, Manuel Heckel. And the question is, Maria Jose, how are the World Bank groups maximizing finance for development and related programs different between backends differently designed or implemented for different sectors? That is more social sectors such as health and water vis-a-vis -vis more economic sectors such as transport or electricity. Does Eurodat differentiate these sectors in their critique of the World Bank programs? Yes, thank you very much. Um, uh, Manuel, for for the question, um, I think that um, it's uh, it's very important to to identify what what's the practice in in each and every every sector because it's it's not the same, although it follows the same um, logic and practice. So um, the um, MFD approach, the the graphic representation with the different steps that I included in in my presentation. Um, it uh, was initially um, uh, proposed for um, physical infrastructure uh, in 2017, but the World Bank stated in that same document that um, the institution expected to um, uh, also implement this approach for health, education, agribusiness, and finance. So the same logic. Um, what we did in our um, World Bank um, um, COVID-19 uh, response uh, uh, paper uh, published in, in October was to um, 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 do a um, um, very detailed analysis of the case of Kenya, um, although it, it was not possible for us to um, uh, write the book that the example of Kenya uh, deserved, uh, because Kenya is um, um, a country that is a pilot project of the MFD um, uh, approach. The World Bank has nine countries as pilot uh, um, countries. Um, and the, uh, uh, Kenya as a country has also been a um, long-standing um, client of the, of the institution. And in that um, um, uh, report, we um, uh, refers to a specific details of the World Bank intervention in the transport sector, in the health, and in the education sector all of them with quite problematic um, uh, results and, and outcomes for local people. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Maria Jose, for your concise answer. And I'm afraid this was also the last uh, question to be answered because uh, we have approached uh, the limit of uh, five quarters of an hour already. Uh, especially with two speakers, I think it went really fast. Uh, and I'd like to thank the both of you for your 
great presentations. They were very clear and I think very uh, graspable for our audience. Uh, thank you for answering uh, so many questions through the chat or uh, just live now. Um, we'll put both of those presentations uh, online uh, on our website, if you're okay with that. Uh, and there will also be a recording of this webinar. Uh, there'll be a special um, podcast version of it and also a transcript. Uh, and then we'd like to thank uh, the audience for participating. Thank you for being there uh, at our very last uh, crash course session uh, of this year. Uh, of course, we hope to see you uh, next year. Um, for now, I wish you all the best for Christmas and also for the new year. And let's hope that uh, 2021 will be a better year than uh, last year. I think uh, the odds are, uh, are good, or at least let's hope so if those institutions uh, change a little bit in the direction that Maria, Jose and Daniel are recommending. Um, and then last but not least, I'd like to show you uh, our website where you can sign up for our newsletters so you won't miss anything. Um, Right, so this is our lovely website. Uh, it's crashcourseeconomics.org. Uh, so this is our episode, the fifth one, where we'll put the recording of the webinar online. And right at the bottom here, if you click on sign up for a newsletter, you can sign up for a newsletter and you'll be posted on all the developments that will take place uh, in the next year. So for now, thanks again. Thank you for participating. Uh, thank you so much again, Maria Jose and Daniel for sharing your uh, explicit and uh, splendid views with us uh, today. And uh, yeah, let's hope for a better year in 2021 and see you all then. Ciao.